Um, I had finished writing the movie and making the movie Crazy Stupid Love, and it had happened very quickly, which is an unusual thing in Hollywood. And I was just kind of stuck. I had writer's block. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do next. So I'm procrastinating from work, and I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And I come across a letter, uh, a, a news article, on a guy who discovered a letter from John Lennon 40 years after it was meant to be delivered. He wrote you a letter. What the hell are you talking about? John Lennon wrote you a letter, pal, in 1971. It was instant for me on this one. I read the story, and the story was this musician, Steve Tilston, in England, had been a young and up-and-coming musician. He had done an interview with a music magazine as a young man, saying he was worried about what fame and fortune might do to his art. Cut to 40 years later, and he finds out and discovers that John Lennon, 40 years previously, had read that initial interview and written him a letter offering him advice and his home phone number, and he didn't get it until he was in his 60s. The story I couldn't stop thinking about was, what if it had? What if he had become everything he worried he was going to become, and then, at 60-plus, got this letter that could have changed everything? So help me God, I will never be forced to sing those songs again. He's a man who wants to do more and wants to connect in a different way to the music, but he's really, really far along in his journey and he's made the choices that have defined him and his legacy. And now he's trying to kind of start from scratch. It's, you know, it's, it's Barry Manilow by any other name deciding to start becoming a coffee house singer and write acoustic, acoustic songs. And, and I think that's a beautiful attempt. You know, part of the fun with Al in this film is watching him try to be a better man and get in his own way and fail numerous times, but he's, it's the attempt that's noble. And that goes for his music and his family and all the things in the film. I feel pretty confident this will be the last time I ever see you. And despite your celebrity and despite what I want for my own family, I will not try to stop that. You did this. I think what Danny's battling is kind of current for today in a way. I mean, we, we are living in two different universes in the world. There's, there's the world that 99.9% .9 of us live in, and then there's this world that the Danny Collins of the world live in. And the two are so diametrically opposed. And while, yes, we all have the same problems and we worry about our marriages and our kids and, and our lives, the day-to-day the, the -day life is just so uniformly different, I, I think. You know, it's, it's Danny Collins or Al Pacino by another name in this kind of rich, over-the-top, lavish lifestyle, seeing what it re how the, really the other half lives and really getting to see it, not doing the grass is always greener. I, I'd like to live like a regular person, but then actually here's what it is, you know, dad showing up for the first time in the life. Just give me a day to do something good for you. And then, you know, I'm gone forever. And uh, you still go to heaven because you're so damn tired. And I will still go to hell because, you know, you can't buy redemption. At the end of the day, it's like stripping away all the BS out of that type of character and kind of letting him ultimately become a, a fully formed human being, hopefully. By the end of the movie, one of the exciting things, and I found it now screening the movie around, is you almost forget that Danny Collins isn't a real kind of musical existing figure in our own lives. The movie ends and you kind of, you know it's out and you know you've just watched a movie, but it's almost like, oh wait, Danny Collins isn't a real singer. He, he almost created this kind of his own version of this Neil Diamond, Rod Stewart, Barry Manilow-esque guy. And you forget that it's not someone that your parents went and saw in concert.